Hi, I'm Old Norse Specialist Dr. Jackson Crawford. Today, I want to talk about a characteristic of Norse literature, the Eddas and sagas, that I think is not often put well and descriptively into words because it's a little bit difficult to. But I think when you grasp what a central concept it is to their literature and culture, that it really stands out. And that's what I call the active fatalism of the Norse. So in this video, I'm going to give you some examples of what I mean and a uh, little bit about how I think in this modern world we can take some encouragement from that active fatalism. I start this video by thanking my Patreon supporters who helped make it possible for me to make a living teaching the subjects of my expertise in the world's most beautiful places. And uh, to everyone who buys my books, thank you so much. So when we speak of fatalism, very often I think that we conflate it with pessimism. And while those can be related, I think that a fatalist can be a pessimist and vice versa. I think that you can be a pessimist without believing in fate per se. And I think that you can be a fatalist who perhaps even sees fate as largely menacing, but not pessimistic about your ability. Or maybe I should say rather in a Norse context, especially your obligation to do something about it. I think especially of, well, there's probably a really obvious mythical example in the myth of Ragnarok, right? We know that Ragnarok is coming thanks to certain poems in the poetic era, especially. Uh, there's Voluspal, in which uh, a, a witch, probably dead, talks about the beginning and the end of the world at the request of Odin, and she is explicitly addressing Odin. She tells Odin how he's going to die. And there's Vav through in this mall, in which Odin exchanges uh, tidbits about the past and the future with a Jotun, or anti-god, or giant, one of the enemies of the gods. And uh, there also Odin is told about how he will die at Ragnarok. So Odin has been given a comprehensive picture of how his life will end, but it's noticeable that in spite of the fact that this is apparently not changeable, he does try to change it, right? He knows that the wolf Fenrir will swallow him at Ragnarok, and yet he is accumulating the biggest army that he can of men who have died in battle in Valhul in order to fight the wolf and the other monsters who will confront the gods and their allies at Ragnarok. There's not a sense that being fated to a bad end lets one off the hook of good, or at least maybe I should say better, defiant behavior. And we see this in the human world as well, in what I think may be lesser known, but almost more sympathetic examples, because of course, even human heroes have more in common with us than gods do. So the great Volsung hero Sigurdr has a very comprehensive picture of what his fate will be, his uncle Gripir tells him in Gripispol, Gripir's prophecy, stanza 31. Uh, this is in addition to many other things about the specific problems he's going to face in the future, but I, I found this one a particularly striking one. He's talking about Sigurdr and the Valkyrie, Sigurdr or Brynhildr, uh, that he's going to meet. It munud alla eiða vinna hul fastlega, fo munud halda. Veri tevir thu gjuka gestr eina nót, manta tu horska hemis fostru. You too will swear all oaths completely firmly, 
you will hold few. You will have been the guest of Gyuki for one night, and you will forget the wise foster daughter of Hamir. That's the Valkyrie Brynhildr that he's made all these promises of love to. So here he's being told, future tense, and this will come to pass because prophecies and Norse myths and sagas always do. She's being told, future tense, you're going to swear oaths, you're going to break them, and you're going to forget this person, <laughs> right? And yet, Sigurdr goes, meets this woman, is enraptured by her beauty and wisdom. They swear one another oaths, including that they will marry one another, and then they go on to forget one another, or at least Sigurdr forgets Brynhildr. It's actually sort of unclear in the narrative whether she forgets him or not. Um, it's, you know, it's not necessarily encouraging, and of course it could all just be storytelling techniques in a sense, because there's no authorial voice, no narrator voice that's uh, able to step outside and say, well, you know, now uh, this was predestined, but Sigurd doesn't know it. The only way to sort of have anything said is to have someone say it, and it makes sense in a sense for it to be the person that it's about to be the one talked to. At the same time, narrative device or not, in the absence of a uh, third-person narratorial voice in these poems, the the notion that I find striking is like, well, it may be doomed, but that doesn't mean that it's not the right thing for you to do. There's many more examples of this in Old English and Old Norse literature. I'll come right back to this in a moment. Let me give you, let me give you a quick word from my friends and partners at Grimfrost. So the very similar Old English literature has a lot of quotes related to this. Uh, there's one in the Battle of Malden. I've been away from any internet for a while, and I realized I didn't have this written down anywhere, but it is something like in the Battle of Malden, let our spirit be keener, let our heart be bolder as our strength grows less, which I've always thought was a pretty profound statement of this code, right? It's the, 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 the vicissitudes of external reality don't let you off the hook for being as defiant of that reality as you can be. Beowulf also says something very similar, and this one I at least remember in Old English. Weird, of nered und feitne er thona his elendeach. Weird, meaning fate or luck. It's not a very personal force in Old English, like the order of Old Norse. Um, often enough will save a man when his courage holds. And uh, there, I think, is a little bit of the thin hope that this defiance of fate is hanging on, that almost there's a sense that, well, this is 99% unavoidable, but if you at least are courageous, maybe your courage somehow sways the calculus of fate. But you should not put too much hope in hope per se, because remember, hope is the name of the saliva that runs out of the mouth of Fenrir, where he is imprisoned till Ragnarok, where he will kill Odin. There's something, I think, stunningly concise in naming something so vicious in implication and so low, right? I mean, it's spit from a from a canine. It's not it's not a beautiful creek or something. Naming that hope, right? It's a it's such a dismissal of of passive hope. But of course, that's exactly what we'd expect from a culture where we get uh, quotations like these. Uh, I think of Sigurdr saying in Falfness Mall stanza ten, "Fe roda vil firda fer." Till ins ena dags, thwi at enu sinni skal alda hver fara til heljar hedan. Each man wants to rule his money always till the one day, and of course the one day is the day of death. Because at one time every man must go from here to hell. Now keep in mind 
that sounds like a uh, violation of the sort of classic big book of Norse myth, big website of Norse myth understanding of, of the afterlife where uh, men who die in battle go to Valhol and other people go to hell. But very often in early poetry, it's talked about as though everyone goes to hell. And uh, that may be an earlier concept, which in a way, ignoring the, the whole code of Drangskapper, right, Norse manliness, which I've discussed in several videos, and it's kind of bound up with the, the idea of fate. But the idea of fate, I think, is, is older than the, the Drangskapper ideal and the, the Valhol afterlife that it's associated with. I think that there's something if in fact, as I've discussed in another video, hell was originally kind of the afterlife for everyone, it's just the shadow, kind of like in the Iliad that everybody goes to, um, there's something even more beautiful and poignant about defying fate, knowing that all of the good that you're going to get is going to be on this earth, right? There's no reward in the afterlife. Um, in fact, you see something very like that in several stanzas of Havamal, including the most famous stanza 77, uh, cows die, kinsmen die, you yourself die the same way. I know one thing that never dies, the judgment on the one who's died. Emphasizing nothing about reward in the afterlife, nothing about obligations to uh, family or any of these other things that people try to right into Havamal. It's a very earthly notion that this alone is our plane of action. I think we also see that even stated by a, a god or god-like figure. It's hard to tell exactly what Skirner is, but he's the messenger of the god Freuer. And in Sansa 13 of the poem devoted to his adventure, for Skirnes or Skirnesmal, he says, Kosteru betri heldren nat klukvase there are better choices than to lose heart for a man who is um, ready to go. Fus fara is literally like eager of journeys. One day my life was already shaped and all my life made. So this notion that whatever that path is that lies before you, it's already shaped, and maybe the real test is just ignoring that shape as much as one can and trying to impose one's own courage in, in achieving one's own desires or just a good name for oneself or, or, or something like that. It's a very earthy philosophy and it's one that, um, you know, I always sort of struggle to make these connections of, of uh, you know, medieval philosophy from modern times or things like that. I think that people uh, usually are actually taking modern philosophy and trying to jam it into things from the ancient or medieval world that justify it. But in this case, I think that you really can take something truly medieval or truly, you know, late Viking age and and rise to the, I like how the wind is picking up as I, as I, I fumble for words here, uh, as if I'm going to have a really dramatic punchline. Um, rise to the simple honor of having done courageously and having pursued one's goals on the one field that's given to us to achieve them in and on the one course that your life can take. I don't know how to explain it, but for me, that has often been an encouraging thought, right? Um, not that I've ever literally believed in fate, but there's a sense that, well, certain things are unmodifiable, even in the future. And uh, sometimes what's coming, including in my own life in the near future, in 2023 as I record this, looks just unbearable, but there is something about saying, I want this so much, I am going to endure, and I'm going to show uh, the maximum saga-worthy courage in 
pursuing it. So I hope that's a little bit encouraging to someone, and I hope that if nothing else, this gives you a little bit of a different frame for looking at uh, some of the sagas. I think that you can find evidence of this saga worldview and so many of the mythical sagas, Saga of the Volsungs, Saga of Herborn Heathric, Saga of Hrokraki, uh, Saga of Ragnar Lothbrok, um, many of the Sagas of Icelanders, Njal's Saga, Saga of the People of Loxedal, a lot of the warrior poet sagas like Bjorn and, and Gunlaug. Um, and of course, even ultimately in the stories of the gods facing down their own fate at Ragnarok. Well, from beautiful, saga-worthy Colorado, I'm wishing you all the best.